James K.A. Smith is professor of philosophy at Calvin College where he holds the Gary and Henrietta Biker Chair in Applied Reformed Theology and Worldview. He's an award-winning author. Uh, one of the awards he won were, uh, was for a book, Who's Afraid of Postmodernism? and Desiring the Kingdom. Uh, other books uh, that he has recently published, Imagining the Kingdom, uh, Discipleship in the Present Tense, Who's Afraid of Relativism, and which is the, that which is the topic of our lecture today, How Not to be Secular, reading Charles Taylor. Now I might add, it's, it's a brave thing to write a book on somebody else's book. Uh, you have to have a certain amount of confidence uh, to do that. Not only does that speak well of uh, Professor Taylor, Charles Taylor, for having a book worth writing about, but it speaks well of Professor Smith for having the courage to write about that book. And uh, his popular writing has appeared in magazines such as Christianity Today, Books and Culture, and First Things and in periodicals like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, USA Today. He is also a senior fellow at CARDIS. Uh, it's a Canadian research organization and serves as the editor of Comment Magazine. I've had the privilege of uh, being with Dr. Smith for the last uh, 24 hours plus and it's always a riching experience. He's come to BYU before we're always very happy to have him come, and I recommend him to you, his ideas and his thoughts, and uh, most importantly, perhaps, his heart. Dr. Smith. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, it's always, really is. It's just a treat and uh, an honor to come to BYU. This is my third time here. Always uh, especially a joy to receive the hospitality of the Wheatley Institution, and uh, so glad to learn with you and, and from you. Uh, there is a handout which is, it serves two purposes. It can help you track the argument or give you something to doodle on when you get bored about 4.30. Uh, um, but my, my quarry this afternoon is um, to try to help us understand what we mean when we say we live in a secular age, which was in many ways the project of this uh, remarkable book by the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor called A Secular Age, and in many ways I want to recognize that I'm just sort of a tiny little dinghy following in the wake of his uh, uh, brilliance, but trying to uh, uh, articulate that. For, and particularly trying to articulate for what that would mean for religious communities in, in a contemporary context. So let's start by trying to understand what we mean when we talk about a secular age. What does that even mean? What are we living in? Is that synonymous with an age of unbelief, for example? Does that mean that we live in an inherently atheistic age? Well, if that was the case, You'd be very surprised then to look around and find so much spirituality in our culture. Is it possible that a society could be at once more secular and more spiritual? <laughs> and so perhaps one of the things I should do, and, and um, this, this is, this is uh, I'm improvising here a little bit, so, so hang on with me for a second. Um, let me try to provide a little bit of a taxonomy of the way the word secular is used, because I think there are three different ways that the word is used, okay? First, sometimes there is a meaning of the word secular that we contrast with the word sacred. Does that sound like a familiar distinction that others have heard? So we would have sacred music and secular music, right? There would be sacred spaces and secular spaces. And what the word secular means in that kind of context is really just referring to something this worldly, something temporal, something to do with this earth, with creation or something like that. That's a very ancient and old way of using the word secular. It's actually, I think, not the way the word is mostly used today. The way the word is mostly invoked today is centers around what I'm gonna call the second sense of the word secular, or secular to, we might call it, which means this. 
We say that something is secular, and by doing so, we claim or suggest that it is neutral, unbiased, objective, rational, and a-religious. Does that sound like a familiar use of the word secular? So uh, a religious university would stand in contrast to a secular university. And that allegedly secular university would pretend to be, sorry, I'm already giving up my critique here, but would pretend to be neutral, objective, rational, unbiased, and a-religious. That's usually, that second sense of the word secular is the meaning of secular that's assumed in what we talk about as secularism as a sort of dogmatic and doctrinaire agenda to exclude religious voices from public spaces. Right? Is everybody with me? So if you think that the word secular means, and, 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 it, and in this, it's in the second sense that you would then sort of pride yourself on being secular, right? Well, you might be you might believe in myths and religious ideas and you might be sort of tainted by bias and tradition and belief, but we are secular. By that we mean we are enlightened, rational, objective, unbiased, and a-religious. And so secularism then is both a political and public sort of program, agenda, to make public spaces and public discourse be devoid of the religious. Right? So it's, a, it's an agenda that is informed by that particular notion of secularism. Secularism is always secular to-ism in a way. Right? Now, part of what I want us to work through today is precisely why I think that second meaning of the word secular, which is also the dominant meaning of the word secular, is completely unsustainable, is just a bad idea and actually isn't helpful for understanding what it means to live in a secular age. And so really think of the rest of the time here this afternoon is me trying to explain a third way of using the word secular. And I'm going to I'm going to tease you and not give you that definition just yet, all right? However, what I do want to suggest let's assume this, we live in a secular age. The question is what does that mean? And I want to argue that secularist accounts of our secular age don't do justice to the complexities and messiness of the world that we live in. And that, in fact, non-secularist accounts of a secular age do better justice to the complexity of the phenomena that we bump into in our contemporary experience. That's, that's a bit heavy to lay on you right up front here, but I'm hoping that will make a lot more sense in about 17 minutes, okay? So, let's, let's uh, um, because at the end of the day, there's so much I wanna to talk to you about. I'm, sorry, I'm trying to just sort of, um, at the end of the day, what, what I want us to come away with is a sense of how messy and complex things are. And I think that will actually give us a much more mature and uh, um, wiser account that we live in than secularism wants to, t than the story that secularism wants to tell. Things are complicated, and I actually think that it's religious communities and religious traditions that are best poised to appreciate the complexity of a secular age. So let me start by trying to show why I think secularist accounts of our secular age don't work, are, are unhelpful, and ultimately don't do the explanatory work that they claim. And I'm going to call these, I want to point to several phenomena that I'm going to call skylights in our brass heaven and try to point to what I think are some, just a few examples in popular culture of enduring spiritual longing and hunger for transcendence that new atheist and secularist accounts of the contemporary age can't make sense of and can't explain. Because in many ways, what the secularist tells is a secularization story, a secularization theory, which basically says something like this. As Western culture becomes more enlightened, more scientific, more rational, more democratic, and more capitalist, people will become less and less and less religious. 
And so it's a story of increased rationality, illumination, enlightenment, and sort of democratic participation. And in doing so, we will throw off the old uh, uh, um, fables and myths of religious traditions and communities. But the fact is that story hasn't proven to be true at all. So what do we do with the fact of this shift, this change? What I want to suggest is instead of entrenchment or a kind of fortress mentality, mentality, even those of us who are in religious communities should be interested in these enduring expressions of longing for something ultimate, something other, something divine, some fullness that can't be easily reduced to the natural or commodified by the commercial. Often, religious folks are a bit hasty in writing off these expressions as kind of misguided and mushy and even idolatrous. And in the end, that might be true. But I want us to just pause for a second to appreciate that these phenomena still exist in our secular culture. In a sense, we should be intrigued that such longing still endures in a secular age. And instead of finding it as something to attack, we might find something to actually build on. The question I want us to think about is, why does our secular age still seem haunted? Why do we still seem haunted by something else? Let me give you a few examples. The first example would be from music, popular music, which is always a risk because there's probably, you know, 200 people in here, and that means we have 200 sets of musical tastes. So I have no hopes of finding the sort of lingua franca in music. But what's interesting to me, and what interests Charles Taylor, is the extent to which even in late modern secular culture, there is still this surprising longing for a kind of enchantment and a deep enduring sense that something has been lost. This is really powerfully captured and, and succinctly articulated, I think, in the work of a British novelist named Julian Barnes. We, don't, we still don't read him that much on this side of the Atlantic. But in 2008, he published a memoir when I was living in England called Nothing to be Frightened of. And Julian Barnes is in many ways kind of the poster child for how secular England is. Do you know what I mean? Like he's the kind of person who literally, he says, has never been to a church or religious service in his entire life. Right? He is very much the product of a secularized generation in the United Kingdom and in Europe more broadly. And yet, in his memoir, Nothing to be Frightened of, several times he says this, I don't believe in God, but I miss him. How intriguing, right? I don't believe in God, but I miss him. Now. You could focus on the first half of that statement and say, see, he doesn't believe in God. That's what's wrong with the world. I'm interested in the second half of the statement. Why do you miss him then? What's going on here? That kind of dynamic of a sense of something full and transcendent and other being lost is something you can hear in music. And th this would be a fun exercise for you to do if you think of the own, your own uh, the, the sort of music that you listen to listen again to the catalog of lyrics and see if you don't hear something like this. I'm going to give you one example uh, from a band called the Postal Service. Pretty much anything Ben Gibbard has ever written for Death Cab for Cutie or the Postal Service works here. Here's one uh, st couple of stanzas from a song called Clark Gable. I'm not going to sing it. I'm just going to read it. It's a lot better in music, but here's, here's what he says. I want so badly to believe... Uh, by the way, I should back up. Uh... Postal Service, Death Cab for Cutie, Heart of Seattle, Godlessness. <laughs> Do you know, like, I mean, I, I, all I want to say is there's nothing religious about this band at all. And they are coming out of their sort of post Nirvana, Seattle, Northwest, Pacific culture kind of thing. But listen to this I want so badly to believe that there is truth and love is real. And I want life in every word to the extent that it's absurd. And I'm looking through the glass where the light bends at the cracks, and I'm screaming at the top of my lungs, pretending the echoes belong to someone, someone I used to know. Right? Listen to that. I want so badly to believe that there is truth and love is real. What kind of longing is that that's going on, right? In the heart of advanced popular culture, so to speak. 
I find that intriguing. I think that's a phenomenon that the new atheist doesn't explain and doesn't do justice to. This sense of loss or lack, is that a signal about something that is built into the human person? A second example, a cultural icon of design and technology, Steve Jobs. For years, I was like passing out the Steve Jobs biography like they were evangelistic tracks. I just thought this is Walter Isaacson's book about Jobs. It's heartbreaking, it's tragic, he's not a likable figure by any stretch of the imagination, and yet it's such an instructive human story. And in his biography of Jobs, Isaacson recalls a scene near the end of Jobs' life. I mean, does anybody sort of embody the pinnacle of late modern sort of Bay Area innovation development culture, right? And she, he's talking to Jobs, and you might remember Jobs died tragically young. I think he was 54, which we're calling young, right? It's very young. Uh, and mostly because of hubris, because he was diagnosed with a cancer that could have easily been treated, but he wanted to manage it by diet. And in a way, was a, this was assertion of his own sort of control. He didn't have to die as young as he did. But there was a conversation that Isaacson had with him at the end of his life, and it went like this. One sunny afternoon when he wasn't feeling well, Jobs sat in the garden behind his house and reflected on death. He talked about his experiences in India almost four decades earlier, his study of Buddhism and his views on reincarnation and spiritual transcendence. I'm about 50-50 on believing in God, he said. Now, okay, so granted, if, if you live in Provo, Utah, or Grand Rapids, Michigan, you're like, oh, come on, buddy. You're only 50-50 on believing in God. But if you live in San Francisco, <laughs> California, and somebody tells you they're 50-50 on believing in God, you're like, I'll take that bet, right? Who would have guessed? I thought we were all officially supposed to be atheists in sort of late modern culture, right? So I'm intrigued by the glass half full sort of thing, right? I'm about 50-50 on believing in God. For most of my life, I've felt that there must be more to our existence than meets the eye. He admitted that as he faced death, he might be overestimating the odds out of a desire to believe in an afterlife. I'd like to think that something survives after you die, he said. It's strange to think that you accumulate all this experience and maybe a little wisdom and it just goes away. So I really want to believe that something survives, that maybe your consciousness endures. He fell silent for a very long time. But on the other hand, perhaps it's like an on-off switch. Click, and you're gone. And then he paused again and he smiled slightly. Maybe that's why I never like to put on-off switches on Apple devices. <laughs> See, again, what, I, what fascinates me here is the way in which the cultural phenomenon of Steve Jobs doesn't fit the secularization thesis. His story doesn't make sense according to the story of scientific enlightenment, rationality, and illumination that the secularist tells. It's another one of those exceptions to the rule that maybe is starting to show that there's a problem with that thesis overall. Third example is, uh, and now this is one where I am ev an evangelist to try to get people to watch this. So there's this fascinating little documentary called God is the Bigger Elvis. Has anybody heard of this? I know you've heard of this, but so, okay, here, here's the story. Let me, let me, let me um, give you the context. God is the Bigger Elvis is a documentary about a Hollywood starlet in the 50s and early 60s named Dolores Hart. I don't know who Dolores, I didn't know anything about Dolores Hart. I was too young to know Dolores Hart, but she was kind of living the Hollywood dream. She was this rising starlet who was appearing as a leading lady alongside people like Marlon Brando and Warren Beatty and of course Elvis Presley. She was enjoying the sort of dream life of what Hollywood promised, which in many ways was like the intensification of everything that the a sort of American dream had promised. And then in 1963 she abandoned all of that because she had attended a retreat at uh, um, a Benedictine abbey and, and convent in Connecticut. 
And so she's living this kind of Hollywood world. She's home visiting her family in New York. Somehow, by the providence of the Spirit, she ends up at a Benedictine convent for a retreat. And once she leaves, it's like something was kind of lodged in her side that she couldn't get out. And she goes back to Hollywood and she tries to pursue her calling, or she tries to, to sort of carry on her career, and she just can't shake this call, this sense that she feels pulled to actually pursue the life of a religious, of a nun, and cloister herself in the Regina, Abbas, Regina Laudis Abbey. In fact, she was also engaged to be married. And this pull, this tug to pursue Christ in this particular way had such an overwhelming draw on her that she finally abandoned her career uh, um, with, with the most amicable relationship possible, ended her engagement, and in fact enters the monastery. And if I recall, I think she enter, enters the convent in her wedding gown because she's going to marry Christ, and that's going to be the rest of her life. And she, in fact, now gives herself, she's now Mother Prioress of that community. She lives in this cloistered community and devotes herself to prayer and contemplation and work and care for others. Now, the story itself is fascinating. Here's the, why the phenomenon interests me. This is a movie that was made by HBO. HBO people, Game of Thrones channel, do I not, which I've never seen, I just want to be clear, I've never seen Game of Thrones. But all, what fascinates me is, you know, think of all the just horrible stuff that HBO broadcasts. Why are they telling this story? And why do they tell it? What, what's equally amazing is that it is not ironic, it is not dismissive, it is not uh, critical in any way, I would say, if anything, it is a telling of the story that is absolutely mesmerized and puzzled and kind of awed that somebody would make that decision. That, to me, is itself an interesting signal that maybe a libertine, secularized culture is already starting to wonder whether freedom looks different than they thought. <laughs> Right, because here's a powerful story that affects them otherwise. These are the sorts of phenomena that secularists' accounts of our secular age can't make sense of. They, they don't do justice to. And um, I wanted to talk about the novelist David Foster Wallace, but I think I'm gonna skip that. How many, does anybody wanna hear about David Foster Wallace? It doesn't take much to convince me. Okay, here, one last phenomenon. Four, so David Foster Wallace, is, um, was, was in many ways celebrated as kind of the quintessential postmodern novelist of his generation. Wrote a, a gargantuan novel called Infinite Jest that's 1,100 pages long and has 250 pages of footnotes in a novel. Okay? It's crazy, crazy. There's a great movie out right now, by the way, about David Foster Wallace called The End of the Tour with, of all people, Jason Segal. And it's actually really, really well done. Wallace was not... Uh, uh, did not identify as a religious believer. However, his whole life was a seeker and at various times had been made serious inquiry into Christianity uh, and, and had sort of been part of various Christian churches and communities along the way. But he's not, he's not in any stretch a religious novelist or a Christian novelist or anything like that. And yet what, what fascinates me is how this person who's taken to be the quintessential postmodern novelist makes so much room in the world of his fiction for spiritual longing and hunger. Right? It's the exact opposite of the world of Jonathan Franzen, who's one of his best friends and I think the sort of great alternative to David Foster Wallace. Let me, let me give you uh, uh, an example from one short story that was published after David Foster Wallace's death in The New Yorker. The story, you can look it up, it's free online. It's simply called All That. And again, remember my point here is I'm interested in phenomena in a secular age, in a secular society, that are evidences of continued enduring longing for transcendence. Okay? In this story, all that, we meet a narrator, an adult narrator, who is telling a story about himself as a precocious young boy who is fascinated by the magic of a toy cement truck a magic that was sort of concocted by his parents. It, and the story goes something like this. 
His parents give him this toy cement truck. You know, cement trucks are the ones with the big barrel on the back that kind of rolls so the concrete doesn't get hard, all right? Is everybody with me? They give, they give the young boy this, this magical cement truck because they tell them when you pull the truck, the barrel turns as long as you don't look at it. Right, you get it? So you put the truck, uh, trucks on wheels, if you pull it, David, young David, let's say his name's David, when you pull the truck, it's magic, and the, the wheel, the, the, the barrel turns, unless you look at it. What would that do to you if you were a little kid, right? Here's what the adult narrator has to say about this experience. Impossible to confirm, since seeing it would stop it, the grown-up narrator, looking back on the episode, identifies the birth of longing. He says this, As an adult, I realized that the reason I spent so much time trying to catch the drum rotating was that I wanted to verify that I could not. If I had ever been successful in outsmarting the magic, I would have been crushed. Right? He wants enchantment. He wants the world to be spirited in that way. Now, if this was a typical secularist kind of story, what you would get at this point is a sort of maturation narrative, a sort of grow-up narrative, right? Because we've got the adult narrator looking back on his childish self. And so what we would expect is that he puts away childish things like magic, grows up, learns to no longer be duped, wake up and smell the disenchantment. Right? Like, okay, you're an adult now. Get over it. That's not what Wallace does in this story. And that's what interests me. To the contrary, the grown narrator, and please keep in mind, this is a story in The New Yorker. Okay? The grown narrator, looking at his younger self, sees in this episode the origin of the religious feeling that has informed most of my adult life a fundamental attitude of what he calls reverence. What passes for atheism, he says, is still a mode of worship, a kind of anti-religion religion, which worships reason, skepticism, intellect, empirical proof, human autonomy, and self-determination. But the narrator is not willing to convert to that anti-religious, religious gospel, right? He's not willing to tell that story. To the contrary, the fact that the most, this is a quote, the fact that the most powerful and significant connections in our lives are at the same time invisible to us seems to me a compelling argument for religious reverence rather than skeptical empiricism as a response to life's meaning. In other words, this too is haunted, right? There is, there is a kind of religious ghost, you might say, that can't be exercised from this world. And what, what I want us to just point out is this is not something you would expect if a secular age was simply an a-religious or anti-religious age. Because if there is any sort of um, official periodical of secularism, well, it's probably New York Times is first, and then the New Yorker is second, right? And yet here's a story in the middle of that world that speaks to not only the significance of reverence for human fullness and significance, but also even treats atheism as its own form of worship, its own sort of religious impulse. Those sorts of phenomena build up, right? I, I think you could, you could keep telling this story. You could, if you start putting on these glasses and look at culture through these lenses, you'll start seeing these phenomena all over the place. And I think that accumulated evidence suggests that we need a different account of what it means to live in a secular age. We need a non-secularist account of a secular age, right? Which I know sounds like a paradox, but what I'm saying is it's, a, it's a, an account of what it means to live in a secular age without buying into the secularist story that the natural is all there is, right? You might even call it a religious account of a secular age. That's kind of what I'm trying to float. So let's turn to this, and, and I want to try to unpack this in five sort of 
theses or axioms, and we'll see if this is successful or not. By the way, we're going to have plenty of time for question and answer afterwards, which will be a great opportunity to clarify anything that I'm not communicating very clearly here. And in this summary of sort of five themes or five points, I'm, I'm sort of drafting uh, in Charles Taylor's analysis, and I want to uh, try to make this clear. So the first theme is this, and this, this, this is the first element of a more complex, nuanced, non-secularist account of the secular. It's simply this. Secularity is not synonymous with unbelief. So when you hear secular, don't immediately think unbelief or anti-religiosity or atheism. Instead, the secular refers to the contestability of belief. Now, let me try to explain. In his book, A Secular Age, Charles Taylor at several points asks this question. How is it that in the culture of the West, we went from a world in 1500 in which it was virtually impossible for someone not to believe in God to the year 2000 in which if you're at NYU or the New York Times editorial office, it's virtually impossible for you to imagine believing in God, right? In other words, in the space of 500 years, we've gone from a culture in which atheism was pretty much an intellectually unimaginable possibility to sectors of elite secular culture where theism is pretty much an unimaginable possibility for belief. What, what changed in the meantime? Taylor wants to focus on the fact, by the way, that doesn't mean that there aren't people who believe. What has shifted, Taylor says, are the plausibility connect, sorry, what has shifted are the plausibility conditions in which we find ourselves. Now, what does that mean? So if something is plausible for you, what does that mean? It's believable, right? It's, you, you, you could, you know, that's like, oh, that's plausible. I could imagine that being true, right? What has, the difference that has taken place between 1500 and 2000 is precisely a shift in the plausibility conditions of what has become believable. So that now, to say that we live in a secular age is actually no predictor about whether or not people believe. It only points out that whatever we believe, it's, it is contested and contestable. Another way of putting that is this. No one in a secular age can take their belief system to be axiomatic or just the default for everyone. And this is, I mean, if we're honest, that we all know that this is true, right? I mean, you all have three neighbors on your street who don't believe what you do. I, even me, I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We call it Jerusalem for short. And, and where, you know, it's like, allegedly everybody is a Christian. It's like, it's like the Bible Belt in Michigan. But that's not true. Of course, that's not true. And in fact, on my street, there are all kinds of people who believe very different things than I do, right? So I'm not at all surprised that people believe different things and disagree with what I believe. That is what I'm calling the contested and contestability of belief, the contested nature and the contestability of belief. That's what has changed in a secular age. It's not necessarily whether or not people believe, it's what people consider believable. Yes, make sense? Secondly, this is, and these themes kind of snowball a little bit. The secular then, a, a secular age, a secular space, a secular culture, the secular, Taylor emphasizes, is an accomplishment. It's not merely what's left over when we subtract transcendence. Now, let me try to explain this. This is where Taylor criticizes what he calls subtraction stories about our secular age. A subtraction story is usually what's associated with the secularization thesis. It, it just goes something like this. Back in ancient medieval times, humans um, were crazy. <laughs> I'm giving you the short version of this, right? Back in ancient medieval times, human beings believed fantastical things. They believed that there were gods. They believed that there were spirits. 
They believed that there was something more than the natural world. They believed in transcendence. They believed that there, were, there was something beyond the cosmos that made the cosmos come to be, right? So there's all these uh, um, claims about the supernatural and then we lived in a natural world. And what happened is the way this subtraction story goes is, but then along came Descartes, or along came Immanuel Kant, or along came the German Enlightenment. And we woke up and we realized we became enlightened and we started devoting ourselves to science. And science helped us to see. How, and understand how the natural world worked. And actually, science helped us to understand how the natural world worked, and we didn't have to ever appeal to God. And so we kind of kept believing in God for a little while, but then we realized we kind of didn't need to. And then we started saying, is there really a God? And then we realized we would be happy with just a natural world, and so we throw off the religious, we throw off the supernatural, we, re we liberate ourselves from the fantastical and the mythical. And what's left over when you subtract the mythical, the religious, the fantastic, the supernatural, what's left over is cool, hard, objective rationality about the natural universe in which we find ourselves. And that's who we are. We're secular. All we believe in is the natural. All we believe in is what science can tell us and so on. So it's a subtraction story because what happens is the secular is kind of what's left over when you subtracted religion and the transcendent. Taylor says that is not true. <laughs> that is, that is, that is a, a story that secularists tell themselves because the secular is not just what's left over when you subtract transcendence. In fact, you had to come up with something to put in the place of what religion used to do for human beings. Human beings are so wired that you couldn't just subtract the religious and the supernatural and say, okay, carry on. What had to happen is there had to become a substitute to answer an enduring sort of impulse in human persons. And that gets us to the third and fourth points. What happens is after these shifts in the modern era, People in the West kind of functionally imagine themselves living inside what Taylor calls the imminent frame, okay? What that means is people sort of functionally start to assume that they live in this closed universe that's merely governed by natural forces. They're not appealing to transcendence. They're not appealing to the supernatural. They're not appealing to eternity anymore. All we're left with is time and nature, but we still have this kind of impulse for meaning, for significance, for something that matters. And so what, what, what has to happen in a secular age is you have to come up with this sort of religion substitute, and that's what Taylor calls the emergence of exclusive humanism. Exclusive humanism. What he means is this. Exclusive humanism is the sort of unique emergence of a new worldview in the modern era in which human beings start to imagine that they could have lives that are meaningful and significant without making any appeal to transcendence and without making any appeal to eternity. And Taylor, and it, this, there's a very long story to be told here, I'm giving you the short version. And Taylor, uh, um, in some ways, as, as Taylor, as a Christian thinker, stands back and looks at this emergence of exclusive humanism as the great alternative now to religious meaning. And in some ways, even as a religious person, he stands back and he looks at that and he's like, wow, that is quite a remarkable accomplishment. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like he doesn't like it. He's not affirming it. He's just standing back and saying, you know what? That never could have been imagined in a pre-modern era that never could have been imagined before 1500. Because what people have done is they've allegedly come up with this way of making sense of their lives and coming up with a, an account of significance and meaning that makes no reference to transcendence and no reference to eternity. The key point here is allegedly, allegedly, okay? Here's the fourth thesis. That imminent frame in which we all find ourselves, however, is significantly 
cross pressured is his language so it's it's this kind of pressure cooker metaphor although i don't know if that works because the pictures you, you need to see that at me as as a as a person living in late modern era feels these sort of pushes and pulls and tugs and there's all these kinds of pressures on me either to believe or to not believe so Part of appreciating this dynamics of cross pressure, and I've tried to give you a, a really lame diagram to try to get at it, but think of it this way. Um, one of the things I hope we can talk about in the Q&A is, Taylor is saying, look, a secular age is not saying or predicting whether or not people believe. We're trying to realize that we believe differently because we all live in a secular age, right? A secular age is just the water we swim in now, even if we remain ardently devoted to the transcendent, to God, and to eternity. So everything has changed for everybody. And one of this, these features of cross-pressure that I think Taylor gives good insight to and I think it's really important for religious communities to take seriously, is that if I, as a believer, inhabit this secular age, how do I experience this cross-pressure? Well, because I'm thrown into this mix of contestability of belief, I can't pretend like I haven't heard alternatives. Does that seem fair? In other words, I don't live in some little bubble where I'm protected from hearing rival stories and rival accounts. And in fact, people who grow up in a secular age and live on a street with people who believe differently are going to hear alternative accounts of meaning and significance. And so as a believer, what that means is it's, it's going to be more common that my faith is haunted by doubt. Now, I don't want you to freak out about this, okay? Because I'm not, I'm not undermining religious belief. I, I'm giving us a phenomenal, uh, uh, um, what's a better word, phenomenology? I, I, I'm just trying to give us a descriptive account of what it is to believe in a secular age. And what that means is the believer is going to feel this cross pressure of the flattening of naturalistic imminence and the disenchantment of the world. And I think religious communities will be healthier if they acknowledge that pressure rather than pretend it's not there. However, here's the flip side of cross pressure. If the believer is tempted by doubt, the unbeliever is tempted by faith. Right? In other words, if I as a believer am not insulated from the cross pressures that might lead me to doubt, what that also means is the unbeliever is not insulated from the cross pressures that might lead him to believe, right? There's nobody sequestered. The cross pressures that the unbeliever feels are exactly the pull of eternity and the call of transcendence. And that's what I think when you hear the David Foster Wallace story, when you hear the Ben Gibbard song, when you look at why HBO is, is intrigued by this woman, Dolores Hart, who becomes a nun, to me, those are all signals that transcendence still knocks in a secular age. And people, they might not answer the door, but they can't get it to stop knocking, right? So fifth, here's the effect of that. Secularity, then, does not end belief. It changes belief. It shifts the conditions of belief. It, but it doesn't end belief, per se. The cross pressures generate what Taylor calls this nova effect. Because what happens is people are feeling all these pressures, and they're hearing all these alternatives. And one of the ways that they're going to deal with that is this sort of explosion of not unbelief, but many different ways of believing. So you get, uh, um, there aren't that many hardcore new atheists that you are going to bump into in Salt Lake City, well, or in Seattle, even. Salt Lake City is just not a representative sample. Uh, um, uh, but there, there aren't that many just dyed-in-the-wool naturalists and atheistic naturalists that you're going to bump into. What you'll bump into are more and more people who say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Okay? All I'm saying is that in itself is an interesting phenomenon that is counter evidence to the secularist story. 
and and uh, uh, the, so you also get kind of Oprahization of of significance, or 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 you know, eat, pray, love kinds of of modes of of people basically wanting religion on their own terms, spirituality on their own terms, which I'm not saying is a good thing, and it's certainly not salvific. But it, it shows that there's something in the human heart that can't be undone. So what do we do with this? What, what might, how might this help us think about the future of religion in a secular age? Because at least I want you to come away with this. There is absolutely no way and no reason that secularity per se entails the diminishment of belief. In fact, it's one of the reasons why Taylor says the secularization thesis clearly was wrong, because in many ways the world is more religious now than it used to be. Right? Now, in particular societies, those demogra there are specific demographics to talk about. I think Taylor's model helps us to understand something like the spiritual but not religious phenomenon in a new way. What's remarkable, in fact, is how rarely we meet those who say, I'm a devotee of calculating rationality. I'm not spiritual, right? It just doesn't really happen. People say, I'm spiritual. I'm, I'm not religious. That they could do so is a signal about an enduring feature of being human. Even the explosion of different ways of believing wrongly still attest to the fact that humans are believers. <laughs> Right? That, that's something you can't undo in human nature. And it might be a sign that someone is knocking, right? And even their disordered responses are a significant indicator of that. It's like in, in Acts chapter 17 when Paul goes and visits Athens and he goes up to the Areopagus to Mars Hill and he, and he sees all of these altars and statues and, devote, uh, and, and idols. And yet he sees also one that says, devoted to the unknown, to the worship of the unknown God. And Paul says, I see that you're very religious. I want to talk to you about this one, right? There's an opportunity there. Too often, Christians and religious communities lament and regale this state of affairs as a loss of a time when supposedly everyone was a Christian in America. But in fact, the religion that is rejected by the spiritual is more often a kind of deistic civil religion that Christians should consider well lost. In that sense, spiritual but religious could actually be a better prelude to authentic, true faith than the vaguely nominal deism that preceded it. But I also want to, in, in uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm talking too long. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to do all five of these. Here's three themes to think about, uh, um, about what I think this means for the future of religion going forward. First of all, one of the things that Taylor points out happens to Christianity, to religion more broadly in modernity in a secular age, is that it undergoes a process of what he calls excarnation. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's the opposite of the dynamic of incarnation. For something to become incarnate is for it to become embodied, right? To become material, for, for God to become man, for, for uh, uh, um, the spirit to meet us in the material sacraments, right? That's embodied incarnate spirituality. One of the things that happens in modernity and in a secular age is that religion becomes increasingly excarnate. What would that mean then? Disembodied. What, what would that mean? That religion starts to just become treated as a set of intellectual beliefs and ideas, right? That religion just becomes this heady sort of brain on a stick kind of affair, and now all that matters is what you believe. But it's precisely because religion is sort of squelched to the merely intellectual that it is also then more vulnerable to being dismissed as a merely a set of ideas. And it isn't fostered by a community of incarnate practice. Secondly, and, and somewhat related to that, Taylor, at the very, very, like the last two pages of this 900-page book, hazards a forecast about religion in the future of a secular age. Because one of the things, friends, I, I would really love for us to realize is that 
the end of the story does not have to look like more of the same of what we see now. Do you know I mean like I grant it, it does feel like secularism is winning, right? That's easy for us to understand. And it, you might think that, oh, I see where this train is headed. There's nothing deterministic that says the train has to keep heading in that direction, right? The zigzag of providence can do very surprising things. Here's one thing that Taylor has hazards a guess about. He says, at the same time that all of this secularization is happening, this heavy concentration of the atmosphere of imminence will intensify a sense of people living in a wasteland. He's actually invoking T.S. Eliot's poem, The Wasteland, I think, in doing that. So what he's saying is, look, we shouldn't be surprised that if these currents of sort of the secular keep developing, people are going to feel more and more like they're living in this arid wasteland. But that's not the end of the story, he says. Because at fact, he says, and many young people will begin to explore beyond the boundaries of the imminent frame. Right? In other words, he thinks that the, the, the arid spirituality of secularism will prove itself so parched, so unnourishing, that people are going to start looking around and saying, is this all there is? Is this, is this all there is? And they'll start listening a little closer to that knock on the door. The aridity of the wasteland of a late modern culture, coupled with this persistent pressure of transcendence that cannot be explained away, will continue to generate all kinds of third ways, new rest restorations of belief. Now, he, he says that this can go in two ways, and I'll, I'll close with this. And I'll speak from my own, my closer experience in, in say, Protestant evangelicalism, is I see people grappling with these realities in one of two ways. One is to basically say, oh, we're going to get on the secular train. We're, we're going to get on the late modern train, and we're going to just kind of get our version of Christianity to fit what is plausible in a secular age, and whatever's left, we'll just believe that and we'll call ourselves Christians. In other words, there's one trajectory, which is you just learn to be mainline liberal Protestants who kind of concede everything except vague references to God, uh, and you'll pretend that you're still religious. That's one possible trajectory, and I see that happening. But the other possible trajectory is to actually recover a thicker, more orthodox, higher bar version of spirituality that asks more of people, not less. So one strategy is lower the bar of religious expectation to what a modern age will, will allow you to believe, but the other is to actually embrace again the deepness, the depth of a thick spiritual tradition. I think it's the latter, that the so-called spiritual but not religious may eventually find themselves looking for. Christian communities need to cultivate robust communities of incarnate, embodied, practiced religion that the spiritual but not religious people are going to be looking for when the thin gruel of their do-it-yourself spirituality turns out to be isolating, lonely, and cannot help them during crisis. What Christian communities need to cultivate in our secular age is faithful patience. Even, even maybe receiving this secular age as a kind of providential gift for us to renew and recultivate an embodied, robustly orthodox faith that alone, I think, will look like a true alternative to the spiritual. I, I want to, um, uh, uh, sorry, I'm being very indulgent and taking a lot of time today. Is that okay? No, not two minutes. Okay, I thought you had to say. I can do it in two minutes. Here, I'm going to close with a poem. Because it is a powerful poem that I think captures this cross-pressured space, but also the calling of the transcendent that I've been talking about. It's a poem by Jeannie Murray Walker called Staying Power. And at the beginning of the poem is this little epigraph that says this. In appreciation of Maxime Gorky at the International Convention of Atheists, 1929. So Gorky is a sort of famous atheist. Now, with that as a little bit of a context, listen to the poem, Staying Power. 
Like Gorky, I sometimes follow my doubts outside to the yard and question the sky, longing to have the fight settled, thinking I can't go on like this. And finally, I say, all right, it is improbable. All right, there is no God. And then, as if I'm focusing a magnifying glass on dry leaves, God blazes up. It's the attention, maybe, to what isn't there that makes the emptiness flare like a forest fire until I have to spend the afternoon dragging the hose to put the smoldering thing out. Even on an ordinary day when a friend calls, tells me they found melanoma, complains that the hospital is cold, I say, God, God, I say as my heart turns inside out, Pick up any language by the scruff of its neck, wipe its face, and set it down on the lawn, and I bet it will toddle right into the godfire again, which, though they say it doesn't exist, can send you straight to the burn unit. Oh, we have only so many words to think with. Say God's not fire. Say anything. Say God's a phone, maybe. You know you didn't order a phone, but there it is. It rings. You don't know who it could be. You don't want to talk. So you pull out the plug. It rings. You smash it with a hammer till it bleeds springs and coils and clobbery metal bits. It rings again. You pick it up and a voice you love whispers, hello. Thanks very much. So um, that was a bit of a fire hose. So what can we process more carefully? Or what, what would you like to talk about? Questions? Happy to clarify things? Or, or what did I get wrong? What do you want to argue about? I'll show you what you got wrong. No, I'm just kidding. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So what I mean is, the question was, what, what is the actual alternative to just the lowing bar? What I mean is, I actually think the kind of, yes, can, uh, can you not hear me? On, does this mic not work? Um, the, the, what I'm suggesting is modes of spirituality that just cut themselves to the measure of what is believable for secular folks is always going to feel like thin soup. Do you know what I mean? Like it's not really going to be. And I actually think what we're, what we're already seeing and what we're going to continue to see is that those religious traditions and religious communities that actually have high bars of expectation, that have roots and traditions and legacies that go, that are sort of pre-modern, that, go, that have an ancientness about them, and who have modes of worship and, and gathering that are very material, embodied, and uh, um, what, what could you say, um, tactile, are actually going to be more attractive as actual embodiments of the transcendent. So, so in other words, I, I don't think religious communities have to sort of lower the bar to figure out what will people accept today. If anything, I would say raise the bar to what the tradition has always wanted it to be, and that in itself might prove weirdly attractive once, we, once people experience... See, uh, okay, so this is... Uh, First of all, this is not Charles Taylor, this is Jamie Smith. Secondly, this is off the record. Third, this is, or no, it's not off the record, but this is, I'm prognosticating, so I'm going beyond my expertise. But my expectation is this. I think um, there has been an intensification of, of um, certain, there has been an intensification of exclusive humanism since the 60s in North America. And that has gone along with a particularly disordered view of freedom as license, right? That you, to be free is to have no constraints on you. That has shown itself, I think, to be disastrous. However, I think it'll probably be 30 more years before more and more people 
realize just how disastrous that was. And at that point, I think that they might actually be willing to realize that true liberation is found in committing yourself to law. <laughs> or, or to put it this way, that, com that true liberation is actually found by submitting yourself to disciplines that mean to form your character towards a specific good. That is actually why I think that God is, bigger, God is the Bigger Elvis movie is so fascinating. Because here is a woman who has has it all, so to speak, and can do whatever you want. You know she's storing alongside Warren Beatty kind of what the culture is like. And yet, what does she choose to do? She chooses a life of celibacy and cloistered devotion to a community as the way to be liberated, right? It totally revises the notion of what freedom and liberation is. Um, I just think, I don't know why I'm saying 30 years, it's just kind of a guess, that I actually think if, if uh, I think we're going to find more and more people listening to that and looking and saying, wow, that's, that might be the good life, <laughs> right? It seems like you're asking me to not be able to do some things, right? It sounds like it's a way of life where you're saying, don't do this and don't do that and don't do that. And so they think it sounds negative when in fact, it's really a way of life that's saying, do this and do this and find life. Uh, it's a way of life that, that guides you towards yourself. Sorry, that's a very long rambling answer to your question, but. Yes, maybe, I think they want us to go to microphones if you have questions. Sir. You mentioned the uh, plausibility gap between postmodern and, and, um, and pre-modern. Yeah. I'm wondering about the role that uh, Darwinism has played in that. Absolutely, I mean, that, that sort of, what's interesting is the, t the story Taylor starts telling even starts before the Protestant Reformation. And there are certain sort of forces that are unleashed, but then absolutely, uh, um, Darwinism, even post-Darwin, takes on significance that Darwin himself, I don't think, ever sort of attributed to it. Uh, but it, it becomes part of that exclusive humanism package, without question, yeah. Which is then why uh, something like evolutionary psychology is kind of like the place people go for the story to explain human behavior. Right, as if that's the sort of ultimate arbiter. You know, why do we do X? Well, here's the evolutionary psychological story that we can tell about that, and and the reductionism that goes with this. Yeah, yeah. Sir. So I just have a bit of a question um, based on your explanation of kind of the secularist wasteland. It seems to me that there has been a series of sparse wastelands that have led up to this. Um, and this is totally on my opinion, mm -hmm. but it seems to me that kind of that compulsionary deism that you spoke of earlier would be another one in that it's kind of a societal approach to try and find a meaning without any actual individual <clears throat> responsibility or sacrifice that leads to the meaning. And so my question is, is and this is kind of looking again to that prognostication, yeah. which if you're not comfortable with that, it's totally fine. Yeah, yeah, no, no, sorry. Um, but my question is, is that if uh, we do not go into the deeper, more tactile uh, religi yeah. religiosity, yeah. what then would be the next phase beyond just an enhanced secularist society? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Stay there just in case I need a follow up. Um, uh, yeah, it's. I'm having trouble imagining it, and this probably betrays my own biases just because I think the alternative is just so clearly headed in a direction of implosion. Like it just seems like a very completely unsustainable uh, take on how to be human and how to be a community and how to be a society that I just feel like um, that, that, that on the other side of it, I, I don't mean that say religious orthodoxy is the only option on the other side. It's interesting, I haven't thought about this question enough. Um, I, First of all, there will be people who continue to tell them stories, tell themselves stories that, oh no, everything's good, we love this. Do you know what I mean? It's like, like people who are like wallowing in mud and it's like, no, this is a great pool, we love it. Um, uh, so you can, you can sort of keep deceiving yourself for quite a while. Um, I, I guess I could imagine, there could be all kinds of other ways of believing too, right? So maybe, maybe what you would get, well, uh, it's scary to think of, but I also think fascism could be on the other side of it, right? In other words, so what we need is uh, um, 
we need the strong man to tell us what to do and keep things in order. I mean, I do, I do think it, which might, never mind. Uh, um, it, 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 it does, I, I mean, uh, actually, yeah, so the more I think about this, that would be another possibility. Another possibility that I think you see going along with the sort of secularist account, the exclusive humanist account, is a newfound need for the state to have a swelling role as savior, right? So, so the more, uh, the less that you have a role for, say, religious communities and traditional communities, um, what you have to do is you start putting more and more hope in the state, which also then opens us up to, I think, pretty scary possibilities and scenarios. Yeah, That's, I, it's a great question. I need to think about it more. But thanks for that. Thank you very great. much. Great. Um, I'm just intrigued by the second bullet point under E that says the Frankensteinish. Yeah, effects. yeah. So I was trying to, I was running for time there. So here's here's what I mean by that: the Frankensteinish effects of the Protestant Reformation. And I'm going to say this as a Protestant, so I can talk about my people. Okay. Um, so first of all, the context is you have to remember that in Mary by Shelley's. Yes, Mary Bush. Uh, um, in Shelley's Frankenstein, Frankenstein is the name of the doctor, not the monster. And the doctor, in a sense, creates the monster, not as a monster, but as an experiment with all the best of intentions of being helpful to society, right? It, it's, it's, uh, and then what happens is it, it runs amok and, and outstrips all of his best intentions. S and then ends up chasing him across the Arctic. Um, I think in many ways, Protestant Christians like me have to come to grips with the fact that in some ways, Protestantism also unleashed the forces that became secularism in this sense. And even though I agree with the impulse, the impulse was to say there are not two tiers of Christianity. No, nuns, monks, and priests are like really holy, and then people who have kids and work are are okay, but they're kind of second-class Christian citizens. The Protestant Reformation comes along, obliterates that two-tiered Christianity, levels the playing field, and says everybody is called to a life of holiness in the face of God. And so the mother and the butcher and the baker and, and the teacher are just as holy and are, are just as uh, um, called by God as the religious. So what you get is what, what has been called the sanctification of ordinary life. Right, so all just the, the the daily tasks that we are called to as creatures are good. That, however, almost flipped into an overvalorization of this worldly life to the exclusion of it. And and in that sense, also Protestantism was largely responsible for this excarnation dynamic of turning Christianity mostly into a sermon that you listen to, rather than a set of rituals and practices that you perform and so it disembodied Christianity in significant ways and in that sense also contributed to the disenchantment of the world yeah there's much more that could be said about that does that help though yeah yeah great so I want to hear I want to hear more about your this fascism idea because that was my <laughs> question and as I was thinking of what I was going to ask I realized that he probably had already hit on what I was um, going to ask you but when you were when you're talking about this exclusive humanism, I this idea just popped into my mind. Like, yeah, Satan's gonna he's gonna ride this horse as long as he can of us just swimming in our filth and total secularism. But there will come a point. But as an angel of light, right? So right. you don't see it that way, right. right? Yeah. But then he's smart enough to where he's gonna see it. eventually people are gonna get sick of that, and he's gonna give them something new. And that's where I kind of thought, like that that might be where the Antichrist comes in, where the in Revelation, he talks about yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I, um, so but, I don't have any specific eschatological claims about that, but all right. I can see, I could just see the possibility where as as the life that we've basically made for us, the bed we've made for ourselves becomes just less and less inhabitable. Do you know what I mean? Like, we basically have no resources left to either have children or raise children, for example, right? And, and, and our... It, it just becomes, it's like Cormac McCarthy's The Road or something. It's just this nightmare. And at that point, people though still are, uh, what you can't ever, what can't ever happen, even in a sinful, broken world, is that the impulses written on the human heart to long for God 
those can't be turned off. They can get misdirected in all kinds of ways, right? But they can't be turned off. And I, I could see then that giving rise to this sense of almost idolizing the strong man, right? The tyrant, the, except he wouldn't look like a tyrant. He would look like, again, never mind. But he, he, he would look like the person who's fighting for you and is going to protect you, right? And, um, and in that sense, we'd be happy to sort of say, okay, well, that's, that's our next hope. Now it's going to disappoint as well, but um, yeah, I think. Uh, uh, now I only started thinking this way about seven minutes ago, so I'm not. I'm not sure how committed I am, but I. I now the more I'm talking, at least this late in the day, I'm talking myself into it. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of like the book Childhood's End. Oh, I don't know if it. You've never. Yeah, it's a TV series, so everyone should check that out. Okay. It's it goes just right in hand. Interesting. Oh, interesting. Great. Thank you. So. Sorry. So I often find that people say, when I ask if they're religious, they say I'm not religious, but I am spiritual, yeah. and I choose to pick and choose yes. truths from different religions. Yes. And this is what I individually want to come to God. This is what comforts me, not through a mass religion. How do you think religion should respond to that and, uh, and help draw people to identify with only one religion? Or do you think they'll naturally want to do that because this is simply not a robust enough yeah. I don't know that they naturally will. This is a very important question. So my take is this. The, the kind of spiritual but not religious spirituality, which is so a pick and choose, notice that the real God in that scenario is me. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm sort of basically, uh, I want God on my terms. And if, and if God is showing up on my terms, well, guess what? That means I'm the God, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm the one who's sort of in charge of this. And so at the heart of that kind of piety is actually this deep um, uh, a commitment to autonomy and independence and self-sufficiency. And um, in my, uh, I'm not sure that you will ever argue people out of that. I think they have to go through something that shows them the lack of resources that actually gives them, right? And that, that in some ways, um, that could be as easy as, not as easy, but it, that doesn't have to look like tragic. It can look like realizing how hard it is to be your own God. <laughs> you know, like, like, if you are the center of your spirituality, then actually everything is on you. And, it, and that, that, to me, sounds like an unbelievable burden that's going to feel heavier and heavier and heavier, and it's not going to really sort of feel like liberation. It's not going to feel like salvation. And, and so there could be weird ways um, that people get to the end of their rope and realize this is not... Uh, um, there's, there's got to be something else, right? Again, I, now I'm not predicting any sort of guarantees in that. People, people can concoct all kinds of self-deceptive modes. But in general, I don't think it's a matter of arguing them out of it as much as kind of pointing them out, pointing out to them maybe the, the insufficiencies that they themselves maybe know at a gut level but aren't willing to tell themselves at an at a intellectual level or something like that. It's a great question and a bad answer, but. Yeah, so a, perhaps a related question. I wrote this down so I could articulate great. it. So. Uh, it sounds like it's gonna be a hard one then. <laughs> well, I just wanna get no, my no, thoughts good. right. So yep. actually just to, to piggyback off of that, how to perhaps materialize this change in a religious uh, community that you suggested at the end. And, and maybe I'll just like read the whole question so it can yeah, be great. fully articulated. If I heard direct, or correctly, toward the end of your remarks, you suggested a change in religious communities, an elevation or an increase in enchantment. How might this change be physically realized? Uh, do you suggest a change of language and vocabulary? Should change happen at the organizational level? Is change enacted personally and, and internally? So how might it gotcha. actually materialize? Gotcha. So it totally depends on the community, right? And the religious community that we're talking about and what they're already doing and not doing. So um, I'll give you, again, I'll just sp speak from my, the tradition that's indigenous for me. In Protestant evangelicalism, uh, we spent 
30 to 40 years thinking the way uh, to sort of get people's attention was basically being <laughs> like the rest of the culture. So what we did for 30 or 40 years is we basically tried to turn the church into malls and rock concerts and coffee shops and p places that people would feel comfortable. And we sort of turned the gospel into this kind of basic sort of message of self-improvement and help and, and something that people would find relevant. And what I'm suggesting is that was a terrible move <laughs> because all it did is it basically diminished the thickness of the gospel and the fullness of, of communal religious participation to one more market commodity that we were selling people who were really already had bought a consumer gospel. And now Jesus just became one more thing on the shelf to try to make them happy. That to me is not an encounter with the gospel. So in contrast, what, what I'm suggesting is in Protestant evangelicalism, what it, this looks like is actually remembering and recovering ancient Christian disciplines, practices, communal worship, liturgies that I think kind of come with the smell of enchantment about them that are, sh and, and it, they will work precisely because they're so strange and weird, right? That they almost just come with a whiff of transcendence about them. And when people are in them, they're going to be, they're going to know they're not in Starbucks or so, not Starbucks. You know what I mean? Have you ever, I know you, some of you have never been to Starbucks, but it's a really cool place, all things considered. Uh, um, but th there's, th they're going to know that they're in some place strange which will remind them that the world is not just this flat experience that they, that they get everywhere else. Um, I do think I would say, now what that means, for example, for LDS communities, I, I would need to know more of either has there been shifts and or what does it look like now? My hunch is that actually there is a lot of practices and rhythms that are indigenous to um, uh, Latter-day Saints piety and practice that already kind of embody some of what I'm talking about. Um, uh, however, let me add one last piece, which is I'm worried that I've given a picture as if this is always about individuals and what they are thinking and believing and doing, whereas in fact I think there, there's a deeply communal element to this. And, and it won't be what Jamie does to attract people, it will be what we do to embody an alternative. So the, 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 uh, um, the attractional element has to come from communities that are practicing something different. And by the way, in the heightened, in the increasingly individualistic, atomistic, and isolationist experience of late modernity, just having communities, I think, is something that's going to get people's attention. Just having families is something that's going to be weird. Do you know what I mean? Really, being a family who eats dinner together is going to be radical. And yet that will be a porch to transcendence in some ways. That's, that's my wager. Yeah, thank you. Actually, I think he basically answered my question. I was just wondering if you could speak more about um, how, yeah, how religious orthodoxy, as you yeah. use that term, how that's what that exactly is supposed to embody, and then how religions themselves need to be transformed. Um, I think you answered a lot of that. And you know, you again, you, and you you'd have to think about this um, very contextually, right? So, um, uh, uh, Charles Taylor himself, for example, who's who's Catholic, he points to something like the Taizé community in Paris, which is. This, this young people's movement uh, it's, it's, um, that, that in many ways is recovering very ancient Christian disciplines and practices and yet is attracting young people from the very heart of Europe, right? From the most deeply secularized spaces of culture. Um, uh, yeah, so it, it, it totally depends on the particular religious traditions that you're talking about. And, and keep in mind here, Numbers are less interesting here. You know, I'm, I'm not so interested in what a majority is doing. I'm interested in what does a faithful 
maybe even minority community look like in the meantime? I, I closed with patience because I actually think what, what this should be is a chance for renewal for religious communities to dive deep again in the riches of the scriptural tradition and in the practices that have been handed on to us precisely so we're ready when everybody is sick of exclusive humanism, right? And can actually welcome them back into something because in many ways Islam is already doing that for example. Uh, and so I think that there's, there's an opportunity in that. Yeah. Right. And can I ask you just one more question? Yeah. Um, so you talked, you've been talking about exclusive humanism as if these are people who are very sure this is going to work and eventually it'll implode. So how do you, how do you think Which is probably not fair, by the way. Most right, people who are exclusive okay. humanists don't even know it. Right, in yeah. In that sense, yeah. Um, but I'm also curious about how, uh, how religions could respond or what can be done about the sense of that we just need to accept the tragic nature of things, and that it's it's manly to to accept that there's there's no answer. Sort of the the Weberian. Um, and and tragic. you're saying that's part of what the exclusive humanist says. Look, I'm not comfort my, comforting myself with myths. I'm just owning up to the tragedy of how yeah, things are. Yeah, or maybe are. they wouldn't even consider themselves humanists. Yeah. Maybe they're really in a. Very They're just nihilist. Nihilist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, um, uh, although with this, this sorts, this sort of stance, like this is the only honest thing to do. Yeah. No, and that is a very common way, especially for people who have left religious traditions, mm -hmm. to sort of convert uh, to that. Um, I, I'm always surprised at how few real nihilists I run into. Like pretty much none. Basically, the guys in the Big Lebowski, and that's it. Um, the, 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 what I usually, my move was usually folks who tell a story like that, but still have very, very strong intuitions about justice and evil. Right? So they'll denounce these things as evil and that we need to secure justice for this. As soon as somebody can say this is evil and demands justice, they have basically committed themselves to some moral order. And so they're not nihilists anymore, right? And as soon as they do that, then the question, I'm not trying to get them in a gotcha. What the question, the conversation I wanna have with them is, what are the moral sources you have for the moral intuitions that you feel? And and my sense is that this is where excuse, exclusive humanism falters, is that it actually has moral intuitions that are significantly moral, right? Liberalism is actually a very moral sort of picture, um, but it lives off the borrowed capital of Christian sort of sensibilities, in fact. And, and historically, that's absolutely the case. And so Taylor, in another work called The Sources of the Self, lays out this kind of apologetic argument where what he shows is if you want this moral order here's the moral sources you need and that what that turns out to be is god transcendence you you can't get what you want you can't get there unless you start from here kind of thing now that's i don't know if that happens you know in a pub on a friday night but that's 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 the kind of intellectual strategy at least yeah. i would yeah okay thanks yeah great thanks Last question. Make it a good one. I'm just kidding. We'll see. So toward the uh, end of your explanation of the fifth thesis, you had said that part of what um, motivates the spiritual but not religious movement is a desire to kind of throw aside parts of religion that you had suggested that religious people should also kind of throw by the wayside. I'm wondering if you could talk more about that. Yeah, so um, what I meant by that is um, Sometimes, imagine somebody converting from belief to unbelief, right? Or from, from let's say, Christianity to exclusive humanism. They, they might not have articulated that way. If you start to look at the religious belief that they've rejected, I'm always... So people tell me, well, I don't believe in Christianity anymore. And I'm like, oh, really? What, what did that mean for you? And when they lay out what they thought Christianity was, I was like... I wouldn't want to believe that either. Do you know what I mean? Like they, they have some sort of really skewed notion that God is this distant deity who's basically angry at everyone and um, is, you know, loves a particular political party. And, you know, like it just has all these kinds of these caricatures 
and, 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 and a very, very simplistic and basically false version of, of the religion that they thought they were expected to believe. And so they said, I, I, that's unbelievable to me. I, I can't believe that. I'm just going to become, you know, sort of a rational, good, moral, liberal person or whatever. I'm like, I, you know what? I, I would want to get rid of that too. It's just that you haven't entertained that there was another option, which was actual Orthodox Christianity. And I find if you actually introduce people to the riches and nuances of actual Orthodox faith, it has intellectual capacity that they never, ever knew about. So in some ways, sometimes the atheists we get are the product of our own poor catechesis, right? Like we, we haven't schooled people very well in, in the faith. And, and that kind of deistic, distant um, God who just sort of secures, you know, our national interests or whatever, that's not the biblical God. Um, uh, so in that sense, I'm, I know it sounds risky, but I'm, I'm, I'm not usually all that disappointed or worried if they reject that faith. But that doesn't mean rejecting Christianity, right? Does that, does that make sense? It does, yeah. 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 Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.